Section 12 of Crime and Punishment. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. Part 2, Chapter 5. This was a gentleman no longer young, of a stiff and portly appearance, and a cautious and sour countenance. He began by stopping short in the doorway, staring about him with offensive and undisguised astonishment, as though asking himself what sort of place he had come to. Mistrustfully, and with an affectation of being alarmed and almost affronted, he scanned Raskolnikov's low and narrow cabin. With the same amazement he stared at Raskolnikov, who lay undressed, dishevelled, unwashed, on his miserable, dirty sofa, looking fixedly at him. Then, with the same deliberation, he scrutinized the uncouth, unkempt figure and unshaven face of Razumihin, who looked him boldly and inquiringly in the face, without rising from his seat. A constrained silence lasted for a couple of minutes, and then, as might be expected, some scene-shifting took place, reflecting, probably from certain fairly unmistakable signs, that he would get nothing in this cabin by attempting to overawe them, the gentleman softened somewhat, and civilly, though with some severity, emphasizing every syllable of his question, addressed Zosimov. Radion Ramanovich Raskolnikov, a student, or formerly a student, Zosimov made a slight movement, and would have answered, had not Razumihin anticipated him. It is lying on the sofa. What do you want? This familiar, what do you want, seemed to cut the ground from the feet of the pompous gentleman. He was turning to Razumihin, but checked himself in time, and turned to Zosimov again. This is Raskolnikov, mumbled Zosimov, nodding towards him. Then he gave a prolonged yawn, opening his mouth as wide as possible. Then he lazily put his hand into his waistcoat pocket, pulled out a huge gold watch in a round hunter's case, opened it, looked at it, and as slowly and lazily proceeded to put it back. Raskonikov himself lay without speaking on his back, gazing persistently, though without understanding, at the stranger. Now that his face was turned away from the strange flower on the paper, it was extremely pale and wore a look of anguish, as though he had just undergone an agonizing operation or had just been taken from the rack. But the newcomer gradually began to arouse his attention, then his wonder, then suspicion, and even alarm. When Zosimov said, This is Raskolnikov, he jumped up quickly, sat on the sofa, and with an almost defiant, but weak and breaking, voice, articulated, Yes, I am Raskolnikov. What do you want? The visitor scrutinized him, and pronounced impressively, Pyotr Petrovitch Luzhin. I believe I have reason to hope that my name is not wholly unknown to you. But Raskolnikov, who had expected something quite different, gazed blankly and dreamily at him, making no reply, as though he heard the name of Pyotr Petrovitch for the first time. Is it possible that you can, up to the present, have received no information? Asked Pyotr Petrovitch, somewhat disconcerted. In reply, Raskolnikov sank languidly back on the pillow, put his hands behind his head, and gazed at the ceiling. A look of dismay came into Luzhin's face. Zosimov and Vrazumihin stared at him more inquisitively than ever, and at last he showed unmistakable signs of embarrassment. I had presumed and calculated, he faltered, that a letter posted more than ten days, if not a fortnight ago. I say, why are you standing in the doorway? Razumihin interrupted suddenly. If you've something to say, sit down. Nastasia and you are so crowded. Nastasia, make room. Here's a chair. Thread your way in. He moved his chair back from the table, made a little space between the table and his knees, and waited in a rather cramped position for the visitor to thread his way in. The minute was so chosen that it was impossible to refuse, and the visitor squeezed his way through, hurrying and stumbling. Reaching the chair, he sat down, looking suspiciously at Razumihin. No need to be nervous, the latter blurted out. Rodya has been ill for the last five days and delirious for three, but now he is recovering and has got an appetite. This is his doctor, who has just had a look at him. I am a comrade of Rodya's, like him, formerly a student, and now I am nursing him. So don't you take any notice of us, but go on with your business. Thank you, but shall I not disturb the invalid by my presence and conversation? Pyotr Petrovich asked of Zosimov. No mumbled Zosimov. You may amuse him. He yawned again. He has been conscious a long time, since the morning, went on Razumihin, whose familiarity seemed so much like unaffected good nature that Pyotr Petrovich began to be more cheerful, 
partly perhaps because this shabby and impudent person had introduced himself as a student. Your mama, began Luzhin. <clears throat> Razumihin cleared his throat loudly. Luzhin looked at him inquiringly. Oh, that's all right. Go on. Luzhin shrugged his shoulders. Your mama had commenced a letter to you while I was sojourning in her neighborhood. On my arrival here, I purposely allowed a few days to elapse before coming to see you, in order that I might be fully assured that you were in full possession of the tidings. But now, to my astonishment... I know, I know. Raskolnikov cried suddenly with impatient vexation. So, you are the fiancé. I know, and that's enough. There was no doubt about Pyotr Petrovitch's being offended this time, but he said nothing. He made a violent effort to understand what it all meant. There was a moment's silence. Meanwhile, Raskonikov, who had turned a little towards him when he answered, began suddenly staring at him again with marked curiosity, as though he had not had a good look at him yet, or as though something new had struck him. He rose from his pillow on purpose to stare at him. There certainly was something peculiar in Pyotr Petrovitch's whole appearance, something which seemed to justify the title of fiancé so unceremoniously applied to him. In the first place, it was evident, far too much so indeed, that Pyotr Petrovitch had made eager use of his few days in the capital to get himself up and rig himself out in expectation of his betrothed. A perfectly innocent and permissible proceeding, indeed. Even his own, perhaps, too complacent consciousness of the agreeable improvement in his appearance might have been forgiven in such circumstances, seeing that Pyotr Petrovitch had taken up the role of fiancé. All his clothes were fresh from the tailor's, and were all right, except for being too new and too distinctly appropriate. Even the stylish new round hat had the same significance. Pyotr Petrovitch treated it too respectfully, and held it too carefully in his hands. The exquisite pair of lavender gloves, real Louvain, told the same tale, if only from the fact of his not wearing them, but carrying them in his hand for show. Light and youthful colors predominated in Pyotr Petrovitch's attire. He wore a charming summer jacket of a fawn shade, light thin trousers, a waistcoat of the same new and fine linen, a cravat of the lightest cambric with pink stripes on it, and the best of it was this all suited Pyotr Petrovitch. His very fresh and even handsome face looked younger than his forty-five years at all times. His dark, mutton-chop whiskers made an agreeable setting on both sides, growing thickly upon his shining, clean-shaven chin. Even his hair, touched here and there with grey, though it had been combed and curled at a hairdresser's, did not give him a stupid appearance, as curled hair usually does, by inevitably suggesting a German on his wedding day. If there really was something unpleasing and repulsive in his rather good-looking and imposing countenance, it was due to quite other causes. After scanning Mr. Luzhin unceremoniously, Raskolnikov smiled malignantly, sank back on the pillow, and stared at the ceiling as before. But Mr. Luzhin hardened his heart and seemed to determine to take no notice of their oddities. I feel the greatest regret at finding you in this situation, he began, again breaking the silence with an effort. If I had been aware of your illness, I should have come earlier. But you know what business is. I have, too, a very important legal affair in the Senate, not to mention other preoccupations, which you may well conjecture. I am expecting your mamma and sister any minute. Raskolnikov made a movement and seemed about to speak. His face showed some excitement. Pyotr Petrovitch paused, waited, but as nothing followed, he went on. Any minute. I have found a lodging for them, on their arrival. Where? asked Raskolnikov weakly. Very near here, in Bakaleyev's house. That's in Voskresensky, put in Razumihin. There are two stories of rooms, let by a merchant called Yushin. I've been there. Yes, rooms. A disgusting place. Filthy, stinking, and, what's more, of doubtful character. Things have happened there, and there are all sorts of queer people living there. And I went there about a scandalous business. It's cheap, though. I could not, of course, find out so much about it, for I am a stranger in Petersburg myself. Pyotr Petrovitch replied huffily. However, the two rooms are exceedingly clean and as it is for so short a time. I have already taken a permanent, that is, our future flat, he said, addressing Raskolnikov. And I am having it done up. And meanwhile, I am myself cramped for room, in a lodging with my friend Andrei Semyonovich Lebeziatnikov, 
in the flat of Madame Lippewechsel. It was he who told me of Bakaleev's house, too. That be Zepnikov, said Raskolnikov slowly, as if recalling something. Yes, Andrei Semyonovich Lebeziatnikov, a clerk in the ministry. Do you know him? Yes, uh, no, Raskolnikov answered. Excuse me, I fancied so from your inquiry. I was once his guardian, a very nice young man, and advanced. I like to meet young people. One learns new things from them. Luzhin looked round hopefully at them all. How do you mean? asked Razumihin. In the most serious and essential matters, Pyotr Petrovitch replied, as though delighted at the question. You see, it's ten years since I visited Petersburg. All the novelties, reforms, ideas have reached us in the provinces. But to see it all more clearly, one must be in Petersburg. And it's my notion that you observe and learn most by watching the younger generation. And I confess I am delighted. At what? Your question is a wide one. I may be mistaken, but I fancy I find clearer views, more, so to say, criticism, more practicality. That's true. Zosimov let drop. Nonsense. There's no practicality. Razumihin flew at him. Practicality is a difficult thing to find. It does not drop down from heaven. And for the last two hundred years we have been divorced from all practical life. Ideas, if you like, are fermenting. He said to Pyotr Petrovich. And desire for good exists, though it's in a childish form. And honesty you may find, although there are crowds of brigands. Anyway, there's no practicality. Practicality goes well shod. I don't agree with you. Pyotr Petrovich replied with evident enjoyment. Of course, people do get carried away and make mistakes, but one must have indulgence. Those mistakes are merely evidence of enthusiasm for the cause and of abnormal external environment. If little has been done, the time has been but short. Of means, I will not speak. It's my personal view, if you care to know, that something has been accomplished already. New valuable ideas, new valuable works, are circulating in the place of our old dreamy and romantic authors. Literature is taking a maturer form. Many injurious prejudices have been rooted up and turned into ridicule. In a word, we have cut ourselves off irrevocably from the past. And that, to my thinking, is a great thing. He's learnt it by heart to show off, Raskolnikov pronounced suddenly. What? asked Pyotr Petrovitch, not catching his words, but he received no reply. That's all true, Zosimov hastened to interpose. Isn't it so? Pyotr Petrovitch went on, glancing affably at Zosimov. You must admit, he went on, addressing Razumihin with a shade of triumph and superciliousness. He almost added, young man that there is an advance, or, as they say now, progress in the name of science and economic truth. A commonplace. No, not a commonplace. Hitherto, for instance, if I were told, love thy neighbor, what came of it? Pyotr Petrovitch went on, perhaps with excessive haste. It came to my tearing my coat in half to share with my neighbor, and we both were left half naked. As a Russian proverb has it, Catch several hairs, and you won't catch one. Science now tells us, love yourself before all men, for everything in the world rests on self-interest. You love yourself and manage your own affairs properly, and your coat remains whole. Economic truth adds that the better private affairs are organized in society, the more whole coats, so to say, the firmer are its foundations, and the better is the common welfare organized, too. Therefore, in acquiring wealth solely and exclusively for myself, I am acquiring, so to speak, for all, and helping to bring to pass my neighbors getting a little more than a torn coat, and that not from private personal liberality, but as a consequence of the general advance. The idea is simple but unhappily it has been a long time reaching us, being hindered by idealism and sentimentality. And yet it would seem to want very little wit to perceive it. 
Excuse me, I've very little wit myself. Razumihin cut in sharply. And so let us drop it. I began this discussion with an object, but I've grown so sick during the last three years of this chattering to amuse oneself, of this incessant flow of commonplaces always the same, that, by Jove, I blush even when other people talk like that. You are in a hurry, no doubt, to exhibit your acquirements, and I don't blame you. That's quite pardonable. I only wanted to find out what sort of man you are, for so many unscrupulous people have got hold of the progressive cause of late, and have so distorted in their own interests everything they touched, that the whole cause has been dragged in the mire. That's enough. Excuse me, sir, said Lucian, affronted and speaking with excessive dignity. Do you mean to suggest so unceremoniously that I, too? Oh, my dear sir, how could I? Come, that's enough. Razumihin concluded, and he turned abruptly to Zosimov to continue their previous conversation. Pyotr Petrovitch had the good sense to accept the disavowal. He made up his mind to take leave in another minute or two. I trust our acquaintance, he said, addressing Raskolnikov. May, upon your recovery, and in view of the circumstances of which you are aware, become closer. Above all, I hope for your return to health. Raskolnikov did not even turn his head. Pyotr Petrovitch began getting up from his chair. One of her customers must have killed her. Not a doubt of it, replied Razumihin. Porfiry doesn't give his opinion, but is examining all who have left pledges with her there. Examining them? Raskolnikov asked aloud. Yes. What then? Nothing. How does he get hold of them? Asked Zosimov. Koch has given the names of some of them. Other names are on the wrappers of the pledges, and some have come forward of themselves. It must have been a cunning and practiced ruffian. The boldness of it. The coolness. That's just what it wasn't, interposed Razumihin. That's what throws you all off the scent. But I maintain that he is not cunning, not practiced, and probably this was his first crime. The supposition that it was a calculated crime and a cunning criminal doesn't work. Suppose him to have been inexperienced, and it's clear that it was only a chance that saved him, and chance may do anything. Why, he did not foresee obstacles, perhaps. And how did he set to work? He took jewels worth ten or twenty rubles, stuffing his pockets with them, ransacked the old woman's trunks, her rags, and they found fifteen hundred rubles, besides notes, in a box in the top drawer of the chest. He did not know how to rob. He could only murder. It was his first crime, I assure you, his first crime. He lost his head. And he got off more by luck than good counsel. You are talking of the murder of the old pawnbroker, I believe, Pyotr Petrovitch put in, addressing Zosimov. He was standing, hat and gloves in hand, but before departing he felt disposed to throw off a few more intellectual phrases. He was evidently anxious to make a favorable impression, and his vanity overcame his prudence. Yes. You heard of it? Oh, yes. Being in the neighborhood. Do you know the details? I can't say that. But another circumstance interests me in the case. The whole question, so to say. Not to speak of the fact that crime has been greatly on the increase among the lower classes during the last five years. Not to speak of the cases of robbery and arson everywhere. What strikes me as the strangest thing is that in the higher classes, too, crime is increasing proportionately. In one place, one hears of a student's robbing the mail on the high road. In another place, people of good social position forge false banknotes. In Moscow of late, a whole gang has been captured who used to forge lottery tickets and one of the ringleaders was a lecturer in universal history. Then our secretary abroad was murdered from some obscure motive of gain. And if this old woman, the pawnbroker, has been murdered by someone of a higher class in society, for peasants don't pawn gold trinkets, how are we to explain this demoralization of the civilized part of our society? There are many economic changes, put in Zosimov. How are we to explain it? Razumihin caught him up. It might be explained by our inveterate impracticality. How do you mean? 
What answer had your lecturer in Moscow to make to the question why he was forging notes? Everybody is getting rich one way or another, so I want to make haste to get rich too. I don't remember the exact words, but the upshot was that he wants money for nothing, without waiting or working. We've grown used to having everything ready-made, to walking on crutches, to having our food chewed for us. Then the great hour struck, and every man showed himself in his true colors. Translator's note. The emancipation of the serfs in 1861 is meant. End translator's note. But morality, and so to speak, principles... But why do you worry about it? Raskolnikov interposed suddenly. It's in accordance with your theory. In accordance with my theory? Why, carry out logically the theory you were advancing just now. Then it follows the people may be killed. Upon my word, cried Luzhin. No, that's not so, put in Zosimov. Raskolnikov lay with a white face and twitching upper lip, breathing painfully. There's a measure in all things, Luzhin went on superciliously. Economic ideas are not an incitement to murder, and one has but to suppose... And is it true? Raskolnikov interposed once more suddenly, again in a voice quivering with fury and delight and insulting him. Is it true that you told your fiancée, within an hour of her acceptance, that what pleased you most was that she was a beggar, because it was better to raise a wife from poverty so that you may have complete control over her, and reproach her with your being her benefactor. Upon my word, Luzhin cried wrathfully and irritably, crimson with confusion. To distort my words in this way. Excuse me, allow me to assure you that the report which has reached you, or rather, let me say, has been conveyed to you, has no foundation in truth, and I suspect who, in a word, this arrow, in a word, your mamma, she seemed to me in other things, with all her excellent qualities, of a somewhat high-flown and romantic way of thinking, but I was a thousand miles from supposing that she would misunderstand and misrepresent things in so fanciful a way, and indeed, indeed. I tell you what cried Raskolnikov, raising himself on his pillow and fixing his piercing, glittering eyes upon him. I tell you what. What? Luzhin stood still, waiting with a defiant and offended face. Silence lasted for some seconds. Why, if ever again you dare to mention a single word about my mother, I shall send you flying downstairs. What's the matter with you? cried Razumihin. So, that's how it is. Luzhin turned pale and bit his lip. Let me tell you, sir. He began deliberately, doing his utmost to restrain himself, but breathing hard. At the first moment I saw you, you were ill-disposed to me. But I remained here on purpose to find out more. I could forgive a great deal in a sick man and a connection. But you, never after this. I am not ill, cried Raskolnikov. So much the worse. Go to hell. But Luzhin was already leaving without finishing his speech, squeezing between the table and the chair. Razumihin got up this time to let him pass, without glancing at anyone and not even nodding to Zosimov, who had for some time been making signs to him to let the sick man alone. He went out, lifting his hat to the level of his shoulders to avoid crushing it, as he stooped to go out of the door. And even the curve of his spine was expressive of the horrible insult he had received. How could you? How could you? Razumihin said, shaking his head in perplexity. Let me alone. Let me alone, all of you. Raskolnikov cried in a frenzy. Will you ever leave off tormenting me? I am not afraid of you. I am not afraid of anyone. Anyone now. Get away from me. I want to be alone. 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 Come along, said Zosimov, nodding to Razumihin. But we can't leave him like this. Come along. Zosimov repeated insistently, and he went out. Razumihin thought a minute and ran to overtake him. It might be worse not to obey him, said Zosimov on the stairs. He mustn't be irritated. What's the matter with him? If only he could get some favorable shock. That's what would do it. At first he was better. 
You know, he has got something on his mind. Some fixed idea weighing on him. I am very much afraid so. He must have. Perhaps it's that gentleman, Pyotr Petrovich. From his conversation, I gather he is going to marry his sister, and that he had received a letter about it just before his illness. Yes, confound the man. He may have upset the case altogether. But have you noticed? He takes no interest in anything. He does not respond to anything except one point on which he seems excited. That's the murder. Yes, yes. Razumihin agreed. I noticed that too. He is interested, frightened. It gave him a shock on the day he was ill in the police office. He fainted. Tell me more about that this evening. And I'll tell you something afterwards. He interests me very much. In half an hour, I'll go and see him again. There'll be no inflammation, though. Thanks. And I'll wait with Pashenka meantime, and we'll keep watch on him through Nastasia. Raskolnikov, left alone, looked with impatience and misery at Nastasia, but she still lingered. Won't you have some tea now? She asked. Later. I am sleepy. Leave me. He turned abruptly to the wall. Nastasia went out. End of Part 2, Chapter 5